Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the daily open chocolate chat on the Chocolate Life on Clubhouse. My name is Clay Gordon. I'm the creator and the moderator of thechocolatelife.com. I'm joined, as always, by club co-admin David Greenweed Haig from the UK. David, how are things where you are today? Uh, good. We didn't get the bad weather, so we're still nice and warm. Too warm for making chocolate, uh, but always just warm enough to talk about it. I don't think it's, it's does it ever get too warm or too cold to talk about chocolate? Never, never, never. <laughs> Great to hear. I want to um, say welcome uh, to our special guest today and for the next several weeks, uh, Michael Iskonis. Uh, I've known Michael for uh, well over a decade now. Um, uh, he has a fascinating history and we'll go over some of that history today. The focus is on a bit of Michael's personal research into the history of chocolate in the United States and particularly from the role that New York, New York City played specifically in the history of chocolate in the United States. So Michael, good morning and welcome to the Daily Open Chocolate Chat. Thank you very much for agreeing to be a part of this, this project. Oh, well, thank you, Clay. It's a pleasure to be here. So um, can you give people um, a quick introduction to your background and why it is that you started this research, not just into the history of chocolate, you know, what motivated you, but why you focus specifically on New York City? Um, I mean, to, to make the long story very short, uh, I've been a working pastry chef for a couple of decades now. Um, about eight years ago, um, I left the uh, the daily restaurant grind as the pastry chef at uh, La Bernardin here in New York City um, <clears throat> to um, transition into education. And um, about five years ago, um, well, let, let me let me back up a little bit further. I, I think just in general, I, I have a, a, a broad interest in history, and that's something that kind of goes back to. Um, you know, having some in inspiring teachers back in high school. Um, so just a broad general in history to begin with, uh, being a resident of New York City now for almost 20 years. Um, I, I, I don't think you can spend much time here and not think too much about the history because uh, it, it's such a condensed place. Uh, so much has happened here and, and I just think this, the, the history of the city in itself is fascinating. Uh, but about five years ago, um, as uh, the Institute of Culinary Education, where I, where I, that, that's sort of my, my home base now, uh, we were moving locations into a, a, a larger uh, space. <clears throat> and the area we were moving into is in lower Manhattan. Uh, specifically the neighborhood known as Battery Park City. For those of you not familiar with the geography of Manhattan, uh, we're talking about the very southern lower tip of Manhattan, the financial district. Um, our, our facility is directly across the street from the World Trade Center complex. So as we were moving into this new space and creating uh, the Chocolate Lab, which has a bean-to-bar facility or a capability, um, it got me thinking like, okay, this is the oldest part of the city, and there's no chocolate being made here now, but there had to have been at some time. So, so in a sense, by, by creating this lab in this part of the city, uh, in a sense, we're bringing chocolate back? That, that was the question. And that, that's what kind of really started this journey about, about five years ago. So when you were thinking about so there's some interesting questions about, you know, how does one start this kind of research? And we'll get into that. Were there any, were there any um, kinds of food history? So, for example, we have this, this organization called the International Association of Culinary Professionals. And the IACP has a book awards every year. People think of it as cookbooks, but it is, in fact, a broad range of different kinds of books. So when we think of, of think of the kind of genre of criticism or the genre of history around food, were there particular authors that you knew of that influenced your thinking about you know, in larger about how you might approach it, and then when you got to the research, how you might present it to people? Sure. So I mean, I, I think the one kind of watershed um, book on the subject from the '90s is the Sophie and Michael Co book, "The True History of Chocolate." Um, you know, from a, 
from a broad view of, of the global history of chocolate. Um, I would later discover some of the more um, nuanced academic texts. Um, but what I, what I started to notice early on, um, even, even with such a great resource um, like the code book, is that it, I kind of got this sense that there was a, a, a huge swath of time, um, especially related to chocolate history here in America that was, or North America, um, was kind of being skipped over. And mm -hmm. I, I just had this sense that there's, there's got to be something more there. Um, and around this time I started to think about history, I also had a, a chance meeting with a woman, uh, a rabbi, uh, Deborah Prince, who around that time, around 2017, I believe, wrote a book called On the Chocolate Trail, which really zeroed in on a group of uh, Jewish merchant families who actually had ties both to the Caribbean and the cocoa trade, but also to chocolate production uh, back in Spain and France. We're talking over, over generations. Mm -hmm. um, and they, uh, many of them set up shop here in New York City in the uh, 18th century. Um, so that, that gave me a few leads to, to work on. Um, but, you know, I, I was, you know, thinking I could fast track this type of project. You put New York City chocolate history into Google, at least at the time, uh, nothing came up. Um, but one of the things that I had started doing when I left the restaurant with now a little bit of extra time on my hands, like, wow, a hobby, what's that? <laughs> uh, well, one of the hobbies I developed was, um, doing genealogy, family history research. Um, I just found the detective work really fascinating. Um, and, and for me personally, the fact that at least on my maternal side, I was able to go back, uh, a few hundred years into, um, England into uh, Dutch an ancestry. They were such great bureaucrats. They wrote everything down, so it's kind of easy um, to find that stuff. Um, I, I do, in that process, I, I learned um, how to use some of the source material that's out there, um, and I, I, I quickly realized that I could apply some of that same research skill, and I got the same thrill of discovery by looking at chocolate through that same lens. I want to jump in here very quickly and mention to everybody that um, on the chocolatelife.com, I maintain a post um, called The Chocolate Life on Clubhouse. And there is a link uh, in the schedule for this week to a shared resource folder that I maintain on my Google Drive. And there you will find a resource list that Michael has put together, a reading list of some of the histories that he has used in his research. And what I will be doing is I will be providing, you know, direct links to where these books can be purchased. But there is a really, really interesting resource list um, that's there. You know, Michael, you know, many of the books on that list are lists that I recommend. But, you know, I'm thinking about you know, books that are sort of in line with the direction of your research. So, you know, in 2008, um, when my book, Discover Chocolate, was being considered by the IACP for their annual book awards, um, something else in the technical and reference section, which is where my book was placed, was a book called The Geography of the American Oyster. And they do talk a little bit in that book about the oyster in New York. Um, and, you know, when we think about, you know, a food writer, historian like um, Mark Karlansky, I'm, I'm more familiar with his book Salt than I am with his book on oysters. But there is some, you know, similar kind of inspiration when you think about tying a specific food into a specific um, culture of a specific city. Yes? Yeah, I mean, you know, I, I really like... <clears throat> Kurlansky's general approach um, with these single subject books. Uh, he also wrote uh, a, a fascinating book on cod and the greater implications that the search for cod had on global trade and exploration in the North Atlantic. Um, and, and the big oyster is a really fascinating story because when, you know, when I first picked it up, I had no idea that there was, that New York was a um, known worldwide for both the quality and quantity of oysters. Now, if you think of what's happened to New York Harbor over the last 
uh, century or two. Mm-hmm. Um, that might come as a surprise, but but New York oysters were were were, were well known, and they were very plentiful. Um, and he well, kind of charted the, the the natural history of that industry alongside the the story of this city that 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 was growing. Um, and it, it was a really fascinating way to, to, to kind of tell the two stories. And I and I found, you know, I'm not saying I'm as smart as Mark Kalansky, but I, I almost feel that there are similar ways to tell the story of chocolate alongside the, the, the story of the city. Well, certainly oysters are a part of the sort of mythos of the founding. You know, it's part of the purchase of the island of Manhattan from the Indians. I mean, there are discussions about mounds and mounds and mounds of oyster shells that were found um, up and down, you know, the length of the Long Island shore and, and, and in around lower Manhattan. New Amsterdam, as it was called then. So it sort of makes sense that this was an inherent and intrinsic part of the culture of New York um, in its founding for a long period of time. But it's really, really less obvious about how chocolate was woven into the fabric of New York City. But before we sort of jump into that, you know, in addition to a, a hobby which is related to historical and genealogical research, and you're not an academic, you know, historian by profession. And, you know, so that has got to, you know, uh, inform the approach of how you go about and do your research. But it also started another hobby of yours, which is collectibles, right? So there's this whole bunch of uh, area of trading cards, what are called Cinderella's, which are stamps, which have no franking value. They can't actually be used to mail anything and other forms of ephemera. Um, and, you know, if people go to The Chocolate Life and they look at the story, which Michael has published, there are actually four pieces from your personal collection. How deep has that hobby gone for you? <laughs> Uh, well, yeah. Let me let me re- re- reiterate that I, I'm I'm not a historian, I'm not an academic. I'm a cook. Um, so I, <clears throat> when when it comes to this research, I'm probably doing a lot of it the, the long, hard, stupid way, uh, as they say. But um, you know, the the working directly from source material, um, like I said, that that this detective work is really satisfying to me. Um, you know, and, and I, I would also note that 99% of, of the work I've done is, is from digitized archives. I have not yet set foot in a library and donned white gloves looking through papers um, where, you know, perhaps no one has tread before. Um, but what I, what I find with this particular focus on chocolate in New York is no one's really collected all this stuff in one place. So. You know this this project that we're embarking on now is is an attempt to do that, but the the ephemera, yeah, that was. I don't think I'd ever been on eBay for like the first twenty years of his of its existence, um, but I was looking for something and a link to eBay popped up, and that's where I discovered that, you know, some some semblance of chocolate history here in New York actually survives through all of these um, advertising trade cards. Um, but also photographs and molds and boxes and packaging. So I've, I've probably invested, um, I, I, I've never tried to tally up what I've invested in that collection, but I probably have a small museum's worth at this point. Um, but that, that ephemera can also um, help with some of the research. For example, the, on the, the post that, um, that we put up on The Chocolate Life, there's an image of a uh, trade card from Maillard, um, a chocolate manufacturer. He was, uh, Henry Maillard was uh, a French immigrant who arrived around 1850. Can and I ask built- a question really, Maillard, any relation to the count found, uh, the coiner of the term Maillard is in Maillard reaction or do you know? Uh, uh- not that I'm aware of, but, but I am a fan of, of both of them. I, I love talking about Maillard reactions as well. Um, but um, that, that particular card, um, it, it's, it's a, a you know, beautifully illustrated, detailed. It's one of those um, rare instances where some of the actual product is shown in, in that depiction, which is interesting, cans of, of cocoa powder and bars of chocolate. Um, but there's no date, and often there isn't a date. And for that particular card, you know, sometimes you can use the address of the business to kind of date what period that came out of, because these businesses, these factories moved around a bit. Um, there was no address 
either. But in the very bottom corner, it credits the printer, the lithographer. So then that sent me on a path to research this particular printing firm. And then I could ultimately date that card to <clears throat> at least, you know, a 10 year period in the 1880s. So yeah. I find myself constantly going down little rabbit holes mm -hmm. um, to, to find out more, to make other connections. Yeah. And I'm looking at that, looking at the Donaldson brothers and seeing five points, New York and is five points in the Bronx. Because well, well, Five Points was was probably most recently made famous in the Martin Scorsese film Gangs of New York. It's a neighborhood that technically doesn't exist anymore. Um, it's sort of the very southern edge of Chinatown, uh, sort of the start of the Civic Center area, um, the uh, the city jail. <laughs> is, is kind of right there, but it's it's a it's a confluence of, of five streets, hence the five points. Mm -hmm. uh, but for much of the 19th century, that was considered probably one of the worst, uh, roughest neighborhoods in the country. Interesting. So, looking at some of the photos, and you know, if people have a computer that they can look at, I I would recommend they do that. So the the featured image at the top of the page. Um, uh, Michael, I, I believe comes from the National Archives. So this is, if somebody goes to the National Archives, they can find this same image. Is that correct? Uh, it is. Yeah. Uh, and th this isn't one that I own. This is, this is you know, gotcha. open, open access. Um, this is a really fascinating series. So um, it, it's a collection of photographs uh, from 1918 into 1919 that document I believe sort of the informal title of this collection is uh, Industries at War. Uh, so this is once uh, the United States entered um, the war effort, World War I, um, and ramping up of various industries. And, and among those was sending chocolate overseas. Once we get to this period, um, you know, we can talk more about how World War I actually um, influenced American chocolate making. So I think it did have some, some greater impact. Um, but I find this image particularly striking. For one, it's, you know, it's one of those you can, it's such high resolution, you, you can zoom and zoom and zoom in, and you find all this really great detail. Um, but it, it's, it's captivating to me because, you know, this is fairly, in, in terms of, of, of history, it, it feels fairly recent. You know, we're talking circa 1920. And you would think, you know, when we think of child labor, in American factories, we kind of tend to think of you know more 19th century, but I believe the laws at this at this time, um, you know, regulated work in factories um, for children or, or young adults um, at the age of 15. I don't know. I I, I, mm -hmm. I don't hang out with a lot of kids, but but these these guys look a little bit younger than 15 to me. Um, and, and the, the image, if, if you're not able to look at it, are some very young boys with cocoa powder smeared on their faces filling um, uh, cans on a, a cocoa filling machine at the Rockwood factory in Brooklyn. Um, and, you know, it's, it's such a well-composed photograph. Um, it's, it's by a brother, a team of brothers, uh, Underwood and Underwood, who um, <clears throat> were fairly well known at that time as photojournalists. And another kind of interesting connection that I made, um, one of the odder pieces of ephemera that I have uh, is a, a glass plate. It's not a negative, it's actually a positive, but it's a, a, a glass plate image, almost like a slide um, from work that these same photographers did a decade earlier in Ecuador. Uh, they spent a lot of time documenting um, cocoa farms and post-harvest process. So it's, it's also kind of interesting to me that these guys were, were in these factories, four different Brooklyn factories, um, and had the perspective of cocoa at origin and, and the process up to that point. So just an interesting uh, connection to me. But the, but the photograph itself kind of calls to mind also the sort of uh, photographs of Jacob Reese, a well-known sort of progressive journalist who was um, trying to call attention to 
conditions in the poor neighborhoods in New York, maybe a, a few decades before this. No, it fits very, very. So as a photographer and somebody who studied a good deal of the history of photography, these images look very, very familiar. Although I don't know the name Underwood and Underwood, certainly the work of Jacob Rees and other photographers of their ilk are ones that I know of. And so just uh, before I do a quick reset, Michael sent me the image, which is, he mentioned, from Underwood and Underwood taken in Ecuador. And what Michael, I, what I think I'll do is when I do the podcast, what I will do is I will put that image up in the podcast so people can look at it as we are discussing this topic um, in real time. So people will be able to refer back to it. I think that's the best way to go about and include it. But if we look down a little further, there's another... Um, Underwood and Underwood photograph taken at another Brooklyn factory called Greenfields. And it, you know, I think that, you know, it, apart from the fact that, you know, these machines are being run by a belt, we recognize a lot of technology. It looks like there are big melangers on one side and what might be mixers um, or maybe even conches on the other side. Yeah. Um... Uh, yeah, this this collection of photographs is great. I, I wish I, 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 I will eventually share more of them. But um, you, you mentioned that um, that that belt driven uh, these belt driven machines. You know that that also makes me think about the transition um, to uh, you know dedicated you know motors run by electricity. Um, some of the, the images of roasters, again, by the 1920s, they were probably using gas. Um, but prior to that, they were burning solid fuel. And I've, I've it led me to investigate the design of some of these early roasters. Like, if they were burning solid fuel, was that affecting the flavor um, in, in, in any way? Um, but yeah, there, and, and these factories were not small. Um, there is another image from the Greenfield factory. Uh, and we're talking about the neighborhood of Brooklyn. This is near the Navy Yard today. And some of these buildings still exist as, as expensive apartment buildings. Um, but there's another image from the Greenfield factory that is the conching room. And there is just row upon row of longitudinal conches. Um, so the, the, the scale of these factories into the 1920s was significant. Yeah, so... so Michael, if you want to share that image with me about the row of conches, what I will do, I will also put it into um, the podcast episode so people can see it. I want to do a quick reset. We're at about 20 minutes past the hour. We're here in the daily open chocolate chat in the chocolate life on Clubhouse. Uh, I'm Clay Gordon. I'm joined with by David Greenwood Haig, who's the club co-admin, and Michael Lasconis, who's our featured guest, talking about the history of chocolate. I'll look around the room. If you see people just uh, that you think might be interesting, so follow um, other people in the room. If you're not following the club, at the top of the page, you'll see the Chocolate Life and a little green Monopoly house. Um, click on that house to find out if you're following the, following the Chocolate Life on Clubhouse. If you're not, please do. Uh, and uh, so that you will receive notifications when rooms in the future um, come up that you might be interested in attending. So, Michael, I, I want to spend a little more time thinking about this one image that you've got about Heiler's Cocoa. I, I think it's quite interesting. And in number one is that we have this, this bit of hyperbole acknowledged around the world as being the world's finest. I think, you know, that's a really interesting. But also the fact that we still have its connection to um, its, its, its being thought of as um, a healthful product because it says sold by leading druggists. Um, so I don't know if you know, was this primarily being sold in that chain or would we have been seeing retail chocolate and candy stores you know, really popping up. We're, 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 do you have any interest? The, the, this particular card is from 1909. Uh, and I just love it visually because it does reference uh, the city as well um, with these massive chocolate bars and a can of, of cocoa powder sort of emanating from the, from, from the island of Manhattan. Um, so Heiler's was by 1909, probably one of half a dozen nationally known chocolate brands. Um, at their height, um, they were certainly sold by other retailers, but they themselves had 
probably 40 to 50 uh, retail shops throughout the country. Um, they had even kind of expanded at some point into a chain of uh, sort, sort of like casual diner style restaurants, um, if, if not in the country, then at least throughout the Northeast um, United States. Um, so, yeah, I mean, the the fact that, you know, for mo- most of history, um, chocolate was consumed as a beverage that that was still uh, very much the case into the early 20th century. Um, of course, by that time, chocolate was being used in any number of applications and, and eaten on its own. But there was still very much, it was still very much a part of people's daily routine as a beverage. Um, and, you know, the, the health claims, you know, these are things that have been cyclical throughout history. Uh, if we even think further back to um, the emergence of cocoa and chocolate, um, alongside coffee and tea um, as beverages, you know, both in Europe and in North America. Um, if, you, if you think about, you know, why they may have been popular other than being sort of exotic products from, from far off lands, which I think maybe had something to do with it, uh, but they're also served hot. Uh, so in the 17th, 18th century, uh, fresh water was probably not the beverage of choice. Um, so from a hygienic perspective, hot beverages um, were deemed safer to consume. And of course, it, it's well known that alcoholic beverages um, were, were, were consumed with a little bit more regularity um, for that same reason, um, because they tended to harbor less bacteria. Uh, but health claims continued throughout the, uh, the 18th and 19th century. Um, and one, one thing that I, I think is gonna be interesting to talk about once we get into this time period, the early 20th century, is sort of the impact of um, uh, regulations into food production. Uh, prior to 1906, there was really, at least on a federal level, there, was no, there were no standards um, on what went into food products, how they were labeled. Um, and then there was a lot of adulteration happening um, alongside these health claims and claims of purity. Uh, another thing I would note, um, if you're looking at this card, you, you can see on the side of this cocoa tin, um, very prominently displayed are cocoa pods on a tree. Um, and a, another thing that I realized, I would argue that over the course of the 20th century, and maybe it's our, you know, our tendency now to primarily associate chocolate with candy. I, I think as consumers, we we lost touch with that connection back to the fact that chocolate is a product that comes from a tree. Um, but from the 18th century, certainly into the 19th century, that imagery, that cocoa pod imagery was very, very upfront and, 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 and in center. Um, even some of the very earliest Hershey bar wrappers have, it's, it's subtle, but in the corners of, of that, that bar wrapper are little stylized uh, cocoa pods and leaves. And that's something I think we lost uh, throughout much of the 20th century that, that I think with craft and specialty chocolate, we've, we've generally become more aware of, which I think is pretty interesting. So, Michael, I'm looking at this card, and just for everybody, I, I, what I did is I reduced the resolution of this card so that um, the page would load faster. But what I'm going to do, I'm going to go back in later and upload higher resolution versions of these images because if you click on them, they expand everything except for the featured image. These images will expand, and you can look at it more closely. But I'm looking at this image, and I'm going, okay, you know, you, you mentioned the two cocoa bars, uh, the two bars sitting on Manhattan, you know, stretching north and south. And one of them is specifically baking and cooking chocolate. And then another one is vanilla chocolate with the idea being that this is an eating chocolate. And then we have, okay, cocoa powder, which would be used for beverages. But at the bottom, there's this wonderful way of, you know, tying the illustration in to the story 
And for those of you who are not looking at a computer right now, it says the cocoa beans used annually by Heilers to manufacture their world famous cocos, chocolates, and bonbons take the yield of more than 1 million trees sufficient to shade every street in Manhattan, Bronx, and Brooklyn boroughs in greater New York, or else make a beautiful automobile parkway stretching more than 1,900 miles long. Right? And you know, these analogies, I think, you know, provide just this really, really wonderful way to connect with the vast scale of what it is that's going on here. Yeah, this is, I mean, that, that, that's a bold claim, but it, it's also part, this card is part of a, a series of, uh, I think I have a dozen of them. There may have been about 15 of these printed. Um, uh, and, and each one kind of has this, uh, tries, tries to explain the volume and the products of, of the company um, through this sort of, um, these analogies. You know, so um, I, I don't have them in front of me, but you know, there there's another one that um, uh, uses the at that time newly built Queensboro Bridge, the 59th Street Bridge into Long Island City, um, as an example of you know the volume of chocolate bars produced or something like that would would mm. would stretch the span of the bridge and to a height of at the, to the top of its towers. Um, so they're 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 really um, you know just fascinating artifacts, um, and and again ju you know practically just out of living memory, um, this this was a nationally known brand that that just eventually faded into obscurity. Right, but looking at this card again, Michael, I'm just you know fabulous, uh, fascinated. You know, in the upper left hand corner, there is this little inset illustration that shows one of our batteries of the, the most modern chocolate mills where the roasted cocoa beans are ground. And I'm going, wow, that's a multi-stage corundum mill, you know, where you, you throw, you know, whole nibs at the top and then they're ground into a coarse liquor and that, that coarse liquor then goes into another grinder, which grinds it to a, a finer liquor and then it goes and it gets refined again. And you can buy machines like this today. I mean, from some of the major European manufacturers. I mean, I've seen something that looks almost exactly like this in the Dalvis Wiener catalog. You know, and here we are, you know, back in 1909 using a similar kind of a similar kind of technology. You know, you, you sort of wonder, you know, how much of the technology which is involved in chocolate making, you know, where where did it come from? And, you know, how much of the technology that we have today is, you know, radically new? Or is it just how do we take what we already know how to do and do it faster and um, at larger scale? But so this is for me, it's just like a really fascinating inset illustration to say, ooh, you know, here's tech, modern technology that I understand. But, um, you know, 100, 115 years ago. Yeah. And, and you'll see from from the factory images around this time is that you'll you'll see kind of a jumble of different machines and obviously they would have been put to use in very specific ways to produce very specific types of chocolate but you you'll have you know that very 19th century technology of large stone melangeres uh, alongside what at the time would have been fairly new technology in terms of uh, roller refiners um, you know they they were being used in tandem yeah no absolutely um, I want to take a moment to do a quick reset Again, we're here, the daily open chocolate chat on the Chocolate Life on Clubhouse. And I want to um, thank David for working behind the scenes um, as club admin. You've got links that you've sent to me. And David, I see them pass through and I will post them to the resource list on the Chocolate Life folder, which everybody can get to. Um, and um, to Michael Lysconis, my special guest um, here to today, as well as for the next the, the next five Thursdays. And what we've done is we've divided the history of chocolate in the United States, focusing on New York, into five periods. And the period we're going to talk about next week is from 1750 until 1800. Basically, we're really talking about um, the early parts of the Industrial Revolution. And we're, we're sort of dancing around things, if I can, um, because... Uh, we could instantly go to highlights for each of the five periods that we're talking about, um, and we don't want to uh, spoil too much 
what it is that we're uh, what we're talking about over the course of the next five weeks. We do want to foreshadow it, uh, but we don't necessarily want to go into a lot of um, those details in depth. But having said that, we have a lot of people in the audience today. Um, thank you all for joining us. And if anybody has any questions whatsoever, uh, please raise your hand and we'll be happy to bring you up on the stage so you can ask your question of Michael. I think this is just a unique opportunity that we're going to have over the course of the next five weeks to learn some interesting things about um, chocolate in New York City. And New York City is not a city that many people think of when they think about the history of chocolate in the United States. So Michael, you know, can you give us a little bit of sort of a broad understanding and a broad background of how important New York was? I mean, so we talked about this briefly last night, for example, is that even around this time and going back much earlier, there is a sense of place that, you know, if you were in New York City, you'd see trade advertisements that might say, oh, this is Newport chocolate or this is Boston chocolate or this is Philadelphia chocolate. Can, can you, how important, you know, was New York compared with these these other um, manufacturing hubs in the United States? Well, there was definitely um, a concentration of, of chocolate making in port cities. Um, and we're talking about the early days in the um, early to mid 1700s. Um, so that would have included Boston, um, Newport, Rhode Island, Philadelphia, and, and of course, New York City. Um, and arguably, and again, based, based on, on some of the, the research of others, in those earliest days, uh, Boston and Philadelphia <coughs> may have been making more chocolate or at least had more chocolate makers that we can identify um, now 250 years plus later. Um, but but that, that is correct. In, in those earliest days, um, there, there, there certainly might have been stylistic differences, um, but you were less likely and, and st started seeing this uh, in the early uh. 1800s. But prior to that, you were less likely to see someone's um, specific name attached to a chocolate, especially when it was being brought in from one of these other cities. But it would be referred to as Boston number one chocolate. Um, so so what that infers is is maybe some early, um, you know, it, it may have sort of denoted some early uh, cues to quality, um, to stylistic differences and preferences. Um, un unfortunately, none of that chocolate has ever been discovered in any sort of archaeological dig, so we don't know what it tasted like, what it looked like. Um, but as time went on, and, and I... I, I the way I broke up these periods of time, they kind of easily segmented themselves into periods of 50 years. Um, we really see New York um, become a little bit more of a focus for chocolate mm -hmm. manufacturing, I think in part really just due to its rapid growth. Um, from pre-revolution 1775 to 1800, this, the population of the city doubled, and it would then double every 20 years pretty much throughout the, um, uh, the 19th century. Um, so really becoming a hub for so many industries, um, but, but, but certainly for, for commerce uh, and trade, it was also the primary port um, for uh, the cocoa trade really well into the 20th century. Today, we kind of consider the, the port of Philadelphia uh, the Delaware River port um, probably receives more cocoa beans than anywhere else in the continent. Um, but but I think all those factors kind of led to um, New York kind of being an epicenter. And, and that would certainly continue throughout the 19th century. And by the turn of the century, the 20th century, there were five or six nationally known brands being produced out of Manhattan itself. Um, and this is, this is really before or as... You know, someone like Milton Hershey was just starting to get going. So one of the things that you mentioned just then, I, there, are, there, there are a couple of things that occurred to me, but I think the one that might be most relevant to um, the discussion of modern day 
craft chocolate is I mean, one of the reasons why one of the reasons why chocolate came into prominence, and we'll talk about this a little bit more next week um, during the American Revolution, is that cocoa beans would come directly to the United States, whereas if you drank tea, all of the tea that came to the United States came through England and was therefore taxed. So to some extent, I would think you know that if you have a boat which is coming in from Venezuela, that you know, and that are, those are the beans that you have on hand. To some extent, you know, there is a sense of place, a sense of terroir, which is associated with the origin of beans um, around this time as well, right? So you know, were we were were people thinking about you know origins, you know, as we sort of think about them today? Yeah, that was quite common um, in early early newspaper advertisements. Um, you would see direct references to um, to origins, uh, and that might they, they would typically be referring to the port of departure um, of those beans. So, for instance, Caracas would be referring to Venezuela. We have no idea, you know, how far inland the source of those beans would have been, but it gives us a general sense that okay, these are these are from Venezuela. You also had references to the state of Pada in uh, Brazil, uh, references to Santo Domingo, uh, Dominican Republic, and of course uh, Guayaquil in uh, Ecuador. Later in the 19th century, you would also see references to Maracaibo, also Venezuela. So there, there, you know, I, I, it's probably a little bit more nuanced than this, and and people were probably uh, doing some blending, um, but but I. I often say that it's quite possible that just by default, a lot of chocolate in this colonial period in the early uh, 19th century was was probably single origin. And, and the consumers themselves were probably, uh, you know, had, had, had a, a sense of that origin uh, if that chocolate was being, you know, advertised as containing you know, beans from a particular origin, which I think is really fascinating um, because, as we know, during the 20th century, um, you know, cocoa from a particular origin, West Africa, and of a particular uh, flavor profile tended to dominate. Um, so the, the, the general, I'm not saying it's, it's better or worse, I'm just saying the general flavor profiles for chocolate, irrespective of all the... Um, technology we apply to it because certainly stylistically and flavor wise chocolate in the 19th century would be very different than it is today but just from a pure flavor potential perspective um it, it very well could have been a very different experience than the way we think of it today right and you do discuss a, a little bit you know in the notes that you sent um, about the idea that a lot of the documentation a lot of the recorded history uh, around this period is basically around technology uh, in associated with the Industrial Revolution. And you reference the economic historian William Gervais Clarence Smith. And you, you, I think one of the frustrations is you, we know a lot more about the technology and the growth and the spread of technology rather than what it is that people were making during these times. And so, you know, you know, your history, at least some of the discussions we've had, you know, we know about, you know, the development of technology in Manhattan, especially associated with roasting and cracking and winnowing. But we don't know much about recipes or, you know, again, the consumption habits of people that they seem to be nearly non-existent. Or if they do exist, we really haven't uncovered them yet. Sure. And I'll give you an, an example of of, of you know where this this conversation could lead um, you know we associate the cocoa butter press with uh, Van Houten in 1828 um, that doesn't mean that prior to 1828 there weren't attempts or far um, uh, far less sophisticated uh, methods of trying to remove cocoa butter um, but you know, it was his machine that stuck. And what's what's also kind of interesting is is during this period, there's there's a an interesting product that's kind of been forgotten, um, but it was prominently advertised alongside both solid chocolate and um, defatted cocoa powder, but sort of an intermediary product called Broma. And Broma, as, as I understand it, 
uh, would have been like a cocoa powder, but but retaining more of the fat. And often this was produced by um, less sophisticated methods of of defatting. So you would take a you know the mass of warm liquor and essentially hang it in a you know something. Ima- imagine if you were to take warm liquor and hang it uh, in cheesecloth. You know some of that fat would eventually drip out after it had a chance to to settle. Um, and then the resulting solids were ground out and uh, referred to as broma. Uh, so you see that prominently advertised. Um, in addition, cocoa shells were often sold. You and I think I think we, we both share the opinion on the consumption of cocoa shells, but um, that was also a common um, commonly used byproduct, um, you know, well into the 19th century as well. So using it as a, in a tisane or something like that, making a, a hot water extraction to drink. Yeah, and um, <clears throat> we'll, we'll talk a little bit about um, some of the, the well-known and lesser-known stories of the, uh, the founders of America and their, their associations with chocolate. But from, from all the reading that I've done, it appeared that George and Martha Washington actually had a preference uh, for beverages made with the shell um, as opposed to um, you know, chocolate made from the bean. And just to highlight this point, if you go to the story on the chocolate life on this and you look at the Maillard's chocolate card, in the lower right-hand corner, there is actually a box that says Maillard's Broma. Um, and so, Michael, I mean, this notion of taking a, a fine meshed bag and hanging liquor in a warm room and letting the, but, the, some of the butter drip out of it is actually called the Broma process. And I, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm thinking that the product is actually named from, you know, hearkening back to the way this particular product is actually made. That seems exactly. to make a lot of sense. Yeah, exactly. And we can think of it as the difference today. We have a we have a defatted cocoa powder, which is literally a cocoa powder which has less than one percent fat. But when we think of a low-fat cocoa powder, we're thinking in the 10 to 12% range. And when we think of a high-fat powder, we're thinking something in the 20 to 22% range. And so this would be a cocoa powder which would be above 22%, probably above 22% residual fat content, which is very, very high. Right. And, and the, you know, the, the motivation for this was to create beverages that were... Um, as they would say at the time, more digestible. Um, they also commonly use the word soluble, which is probably not entirely accurate as even if, if the cocoa powder has been processed with, with an alkaline or, or Dutch process, it's not truly soluble, but it's, um, it is more easily dispersed and suspended. But you saw, you know, pretty within a couple decades of, at least Van Houten's uh, patenting of the cocoa uh, butter press, you see um, these products emerge and all of the positive attributes, the digestibility, the solubility, um, all attributed to them. Right. And if, if somebody goes and takes a look at the Hyler's card that you've got, the trade card that Hyler's is on the front of the tin, it does say soluble and digestible. And I would say that it's probably no accident that immediately next to, in the Maillard's card, you have this um, Broma product that immediately next to it is something which is called dietetic cocoa. I mean, so these are actually, you know, there is, we have breakfast cocoa, which actually, if you go to the um, code of federal regulations today and the standards of identity around cocoa and chocolate, breakfast cocoa is in fact one of the standards um, you know, so it describes how it needs to be made and what it does and doesn't contain in order to be called breakfast cocoa. So there's a really much more sophisticated understanding, or at least nuanced understanding, of cocoa as a product, right, than we know today. I mean, you know, when most people think of cocoa today, you know, they go to the grocery store and all they know about is the difference between um, natural and Dutch processed. I mean, that's our understanding. But in this one, these two advertisements, we have, you know, a lot of different language, which talks about many, many different products which are aimed and, you know, marketed, you know, based on specifics of the cocoa. Um, and I don't see any, 
any acknowledgement of alkalizing here. They don't say anything about that. But, you know, maybe you know more about, maybe you have images which talk about that, Michael. Uh, actually, that, that's a great that's a great point. I, I don't see references to alkalizing or um, to calling it Dutch process. I don't really see that much in the 19th century. That that seems to have been applied uh, largely in the 20th century. Great. So uh, we're uh, almost through the first hour of the six part series. I want to thank Michael for joining us here at the Daily Open Chocolate Chat on Chocolate Life. Um, we have a wonderful group of people uh, who are in the room. And I want to remind everybody that if they have questions that they want to ask, um, to raise your hands and ask them of Michael. Of course, you can all, always send me an email at clubhouse at thechocolatelife.com, and I will work with Michael. So we have a coordinating call um, before the um, before each room each week to talk of, you know, specifically about what we're going to talk cover each day, um, and then we also um, collaborate on the story that Michael is posting. So Saturday or Sunday this week, there will be a new post on the Chocolate Life, which is going to be focusing on the next. Um, the first era that we're talking about. Michael, so 1750 to 1800, you give that period uh, the title a consuming culture. Uh, can you tell us how, you know, thinking of the period 1750 to 1800 as a consuming culture, what were your thoughts about naming, naming that, that episode? Because uh, it's really the, uh, uh, about the introduction of, of, chocolate as a beverage in, into the, um, the American colonies. And I think this period, again, it, it kind of, t it's a tidy 50 year period, give or take a few years. Um, but what we see by the end of this period is a, um, a well-established chocolate culture. Um, on the one hand, yes, it, was was definitely um, popular on the breakfast, lunch, and dinner tables of the wealthy. Um, but there is evidence that it was also um, simply just sold on the street and in the markets. Um, you know, we see a growth in um, the number of makers and the number of merchants selling um, both cocoa beans and finished chocolate. So I really see this as sort of the, the birth of the chocolate culture, um, not only in the city, but alongside what was happening out, uh, elsewhere in Boston and Philadelphia, sort of the, the, the birth of a chocolate culture in North America. So Michael, I visited Colonial Williamsburg and there's a fair amount of the, I, history, I, I suppose, that was fairly documented if they're gonna talk about chocolate culture in at least the colonial Williamsburg setting. But as, as a pastry chef and in your research, uh, what have you been able to find in terms of the first time chocolate shows up in documented cookbooks in recipes um, in the United States? I mean, in colonial Williamsburg, we're talking, they would say it was used in, in dessert recipes, you know, prior to the American Revolution. But that doesn't necessarily say that it was documented in terms of general cookery books uh, at that time yeah that's a that's a little murky area um you know there i i would i would maybe use the coffee analogy here to to say you know yes today we have some coffee flavored confections we have coffee ice cream but when you say the word coffee, you you are clearly referring to a beverage. Those those coffee flavored things are, are as much as some people love them. They're they're kind of outliers. Um, so certainly in Europe, there are um, spotty references to chocolate being used as an ingredient. But by and large, um, chocolate was you know the the, the beverage. Um, one of the things that kind of got me into thinking about culinary history broadly um, was just starting to look at some 19th century cookbooks just just for fun. Um, you know, as a pastry chef, I appreciated the fact that um, not only were these early bakers and pastry chefs, um, you know, uh, 
cooks, but they also had to master fire in a way that's very different from us flipping a switch on an oven and turning the dial to set, you know, you know, preheat to 350. Um, the the skill sets were, were just very different. Um, whipping up a meringue meant, you know, 20 minutes of vigorous, you know, whipping by hand. Um, so I... I I almost with a, looked, if I can I, jump in with a whisk that might have been made from twigs, sure, bundled sure. together. I mean, so just uh, jump in. I mean, I don't know if you're a fan of there is this um, historical cooking series on YouTube um, by the Townsends. I don't know if you're familiar with it, Michael. I'm not. Uh, they actually go through a lot of this. So if you're interested in some of the some of the challenges associated with cooking and the challenges associated with interpreting recipes, uh, primarily in colonial America, um, the Townsend series is a really really interesting one. And you know, in this in this case, they don't bring up chocolate all that much uh, as as a flavoring um, in what's going on. Although there are one or two times when they do talk about. Uh, incorporating, um, you know, using chocolate um, in its beverage form, but rarely about a flavoring. There's also another really, really fun new series, which is called Tasting History uh, with Max Miller. I don't know if you're familiar with that as well, Michael. Uh, but he has done a couple of things around um, chocolate, uh, uh, primarily in Mesoamerica, so in, in Mexico. Historically, he tries to go and say, let's go find the earliest recorded recipe that we can find for this. Right. And trace the which are the cookbooks and where are the influences on there. So I find it, you know, from that kind of research perspective, a, a, a quite an interesting series to watch. Yeah, well, I mean, certainly we we we, we have unearthed um, recipes for for the chocolate beverage, um, you know, well back into the 17th century. Um, but you know, I was specifically looking for chocolate or cocoa, um, as an ingredient in, um, pastry items. So one of the, the prominent pastry books of its day, uh, I believe it was first published in 1832, uh, by a woman, uh, named Miss Eliza Leslie. Um, there is absolutely no reference not even to the beverage, there is no reference to chocolate whatsoever in what in its day was the most popular, um, you know, quote unquote, pastry cookbook. We really don't see that start to happen until mid century um, and really with frequency in the, until the 1860s. But what's also interesting is we also have more of a European influence, continental European influence on um cookbook culture in general, um, you start to see a lot of French names start to pop up, um, especially with regard to, to pastry. Um, but we really don't see chocolate or cake or, or cocoa used in, in cakes and things like that in, until that, that time period. So that does kind of mesh with um, our, our conventional understanding of how chocolate evolved from a beverage into a solid eating form you know, with the advent of this technology that developed during the early 1800s. And just to let people know, um, we could do a rabbit hole deep dive right now on that topic. But that sort of transformation, Michael, fits between the next episode, which is consuming culture covering 1750 to 1800, and then what you call a second revolution of 1800 to 1850. You know, we encapsulate, you know, in those two eras, you know, some pretty interesting technological innovation, right? So the second revolution includes the patenting of the cocoa butter press, alkalization. We see, you know, other things which are important in this context. Um, and some of it is, you know, really interesting historical. So there are some, there are some non, there are some European players, for example, the Marquis de Sade, who in his letters, uh, you know, talks about his love of chocolate, but trying to imagine, you know, you know, before alkalization, before the cocoa butter press, you know, when, when, you know, there was literally at this point, probably still only coarse grinding, whether it was, you know, in a big machine or in a matate, you know, which probably was still in use in Europe um, at that time. The, the, the chocolate that people are consuming, right? Eating as opposed to drinking is just completely different 
from what we think of today. Right. And, and you know, it's, it's interesting because, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to use all of this historical background to um, better appreciate what's happening now. You know, so if, if we were to, you know, look at, at chocolate as a continuum, I, I think I would have said um, when I first started this, I would have said, hmm, you know, well, the, the current specialty craft artisan um, chocolate phase uh, that we're in is really revisiting maybe what was happening in the 19th century. And, uh, you know, a conversation that you and I had kind of um, helped refine that perspective, pun intended, um, where perhaps what's happening now isn't a revisiting of the past, but it's a, a, a redefining of what chocolate can be in the future. And, and I don't know, maybe, maybe you can more eloquently, um, you know, talk about that idea a little bit more. Yeah, you know, I think that's an hour <laughs> on its own, and we will have uh, uh, certainly um, we may have some pushback um, on it. But you know, w- you know, we can so finishing up this hour and sort of prefacing the the next hour. Um, one of the things that I do want to say is that so the the modern specialty chocolate craft chocolate movement. Um, probably began in 1983. And that would have been with the first introduction in modern times of single origin chocolate bars. And that would have been the French family Bonat in, eight, in 1983 on the occasion of their 100th anniversary. So the Bonat family has been making chocolate in Varone since 1883, but the family was a cocoa trader and was involved in cocoa for probably another hundred years or so before then. We then see Valrona with Guanaja in 1986, and then we sort of jump forward into 1996 with um, the founding of Scharfenberger. And it is some things which are related. We talked about this yesterday and why Belgium Um, that we find that in the 1970s, there was this movement in France around protecting the cultural patrimony around chocolate in France from an onslaught of inexpensive Belgian imports. Inexpensive because there was a lot of milk and a lot of sugar with a focus on fillings, not necessarily chocolate. And we, we see all, we see this modern day movement Um, In some respects, it is retrospective. And I think, Michael, this is the point that you're making, is that, you know, a modern two-ingredient chocolate actually goes back and is reflective of pre-1847 style of chocolate making, 1847 being the accepted date at which the Fry family in England is the first known to be adding cocoa butter into chocolate to make something which had a very, very different um, mouthfeel. So in one way, we can think about modern day chocolate as this being this retrospective movement. But at the same time, one of the differences between chocolate as a product and, for example, beer and wine and bread, um, certainly uh, balsamic vinegars and other foods, is there is a long tradition of appreciation and connoisseurship, for example, in, in wine and spirits which did not exist in the same way with chocolate. Chocolate is a product of the Industrial Revolution. This is the, it is the Industrial Revolution that made chocolate widely available to people, whereas wine and beer and bread and spirits have these very, very long histories of tradition. And the Industrial Revolution, um, for, for those things, did not divorce this historical culture of appreciation and connoisseurship, right? It, it made these products more generally available in a watered down, sometimes literally, but more consistent, which is the hallmark of industrial products, which is consistency and repeatability and reliability. Uh, if I go in and buy a chocolate bar today, you know, I want to make sure that it tastes the same as 
Um, it tasted last week and it will taste the same next year. You know, Milton Hershey's genius is not that he made good chocolate, but he figured out a way to make chocolate affordable. And, you know, what we're doing here, and I think this is the point that you mentioned, and we should probably keep it front of mind um, through the, the discussions going forward, Michael, is that what the, the modern chocolate movement, which was ushered in partly in the late 70s in France with Bonat with single origin in 1983, with what it is that Scharfenberger was doing in 1996, is what we're attempting to do is to reconnect with that pre-industrial roots to, to uh, be able to represent chocolate uh, in ways that got lost through the industrialization of, of, of chocolate making. Um, and to create a culture of appreciation and connoisseurship that really never existed before. And I think that that's the revolutionary aspect of it, not necessarily from a, from a manufacturing component. If, um, is, am I in, interpreting what you were saying correctly? Yeah, I think so. I think so. Um, and again, that, that just foreshadows things that we can talk about in a few weeks once we once we start talking about how all this history informs, you know, where we are today. Great. Well, I am certainly looking forward um, to all of those episodes. I mean, f for both, you know, Michael and for me, this particular series represents probably more production and certainly more pre-production um, than um, anything that I've done so far in Clubhouse. So we're collaborating on a new article on the Chocolate Life every week. Um, and Michael is sending me an outline of what it is that he wants to talk about and images that need to be processed and thought about. We have a conversation to so coordinate what we're wanting to do. Uh, but I am, you know, find this endlessly fascinating. I've learned a lot today. I'm looking forward to learning a lot more over the course of the next several weeks and invite everyone who's here in the audience today um, to read what's going on uh, in these articles on the Chocolate Life and come prepared for questions because we do want uh, to hear from the audience in the course of the next several weeks. And at this point, what I want to say is thank you, Michael, for uh, being, um, for setting up the next several weeks, um, your commitment and, you know, your dedication and diligence and professionalism in terms of making this um, series happen, I think is really, really, I, I, I certainly appreciate it. And uh, all of the, all of the work um, that you have done to go into this. And David, uh, thank you very much for, as you always do, doing some research in the background and sending me links um, that I can look at and that I will be posting onto the resource page, which you can find in a shared Google Drive that I manage. And you can get to that shared Google Drive by going to the Chocolate Life on Clubhouse post on thechocolatelife.com. And there in to this week's schedule, what you'll do is you'll find a link to the resource folder. So the reading list that Michael sent me is, is up there now, although I'll be providing links to it. Um, the links that David provided me today, I will be putting into those documents so that people will be able to do some homework and be able to follow along and um, share in the rich history of the chocolate industry in the United States, but seen in a New York state of mind. Mm -hmm.